Good evening, and welcome to the All Things Fulfilled broadcast, presented to you by the Rains Road Church of Christ, right here on the Now Network. I'm William Bell, and today we're going to be continuing our study on what does Paul mean by establishing the law in Romans chapter 3 and verse 31. Does it mean that the law is going to continue and that it is binding on us today? Or does it mean that, um, uh, does it have a different meaning? And whatever that is, we want to explore it by looking at the context of the uh, study. We began on last week sort of introducing the text to you uh, from the perspective of this study. Uh, we talked about those who are uh, pushing this uh, to indicate that the word established means to continue and that the law does not cease, that uh, the law of Moses, the old covenant, continues and should be binding on everyone. Uh, we'll be underway in just a moment. Before we do, let me encourage you to visit us at our website at allthingsfulfilled.com. Uh, we also encourage you to visit our YouTube channel, which is All Things Fulfilled. Uh, we have over 700 videos uploaded there. And we continue to upload new videos on a weekly basis. And we want to encourage you uh, to subscribe to the channel and also click the uh, bell. There's a red button for subscribe and I believe it's a black bell for uh, notification so that every time we upload a new video you will be able to receive it. And th every um, week from 6.30 to 7 p.m. we encourage you to be right here with us on the Now Network for another edition of All Things Fulfilled. So let's go ahead and get underway with our study. Uh, we left off in the previous study after uh, you know having introduced the concepts of uh, the two systems of faith, uh, one being under the law, or at least the two um, systems of covenantal systems, one being the law and the other being faith or the system of grace. And those two being uh, different one from the other. Uh, sometimes people try to merge them together, but they are separate and apart from each other as far as their function uh, and uh, their purpose for man was concerned. In addition, we looked at uh, how to approach lexical definitions so that we don't just take a definition that might be found in the lexicon, and it could be correct as far as the lexicon is concerned, but we don't just take that and make that the law of how to understand a term. In other words, uh, I think I used the point that uh, use it in a sentence. In other words, what's the context of that word? And we gave you three examples from the word cool, meaning temperature, meaning a person's personal style or charisma, or we could be talking about um, a pack of cigarettes. So uh, be very careful that you don't just define a word and then say, well, that's the meaning, but that may not be how the person is using it in context, which is the final uh, determination of what a word actually means. So we must uh, really, really uh, pay attention to that when we're talking about the scriptures. Now, uh, as we were leaving off in the previous lesson, we were dealing with Romans chapter 3 and Paul's conclusion where uh, he was asking about the sphere or the scope of God's authority. Because in Romans chapter 3, after saying, and I'll read a few passages for you just so you can see uh, where we are. Where is boasting then? This is verse 27. It is excluded by what law? Of works, no, not the law of works, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. That was another word that we talked about, and that was the word apart from or without the deeds of the law. Now, here comes the authority question. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? And Paul responds to that question. He answers that question, yes of the Gentiles also. Now, we can understand God's supreme authority by understanding that he created the world, everything in it. As the scripture says in Acts 17, verse 24, God created the world and all things in it, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And that not only included the heathen temples, but that also included the temple that Solomon built, the temple that uh, was rebuilt by Zerubbabel and uh, that was being embellished by Herod at that very time. So from that perspective, he does not dwell in temples made with men's hands. Well, that's showing you that there was something changing 
that there was something different about the gospel as opposed to the law. Because, you see, the law was based upon the priesthood. And the priesthood involved the temple service. That old covenant temple service. Hebrews chapter 7, 11. We'll talk about that maybe in some upcoming lessons. But, he says, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives life to all or gives to all life, breath, and all things. Verse 25. Verse 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of all the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So God's authority begins with the scope of his creation. He created all things. Every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. And therefore, God has the sovereign authority over all things. So if there is a Jew and there is a Gentile, then God has the authority over it. Uh, in Philippians, or even before we get to Philippians, but in Matthew 28 and verse 18, remember, after the Lord's resurrection and prior to his ascension, he said, all authority and power in heaven and in earth is given unto me, and therefore go and teach all nations, making disciples of them. <clears throat> Again, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've said unto you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. In Philippians 2, he said, Every knee must bow, therefore God has also exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, Philippians 2 and verse 9, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth Philippians 2 and verse 10 and that every tongue should confess <clears throat> that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father then if we look at Ephesians 1 Ephesians says that Christ when he was raised from the dead that God gave him dominion over all things not only in this age but also in the age to come. And so he um, made him have dominion uh, far above all principality and power, might, and dominion, and every name that was named, not only in this age, meaning the age of Moses, but also in the age that was to come, which is our current uh, Christian or kingdom age, as we like to call it. Excuse me, I have to take a sip of water. Uh, throat is a little bit dry. Now, if God has supreme authority, if he is sovereign over all, was his sovereignty an interest and scope of salvation limited to Jews only? Was he going to save only the Judeans? If only those Judeans were to be saved then God's power was limited and that's his point that means God was a limited and territorial God that he would only save those in the land and of the nation but to make the law the standard to say that the law is enforced and this is what everyone must serve is to make that very point and that's what leads people into that mindset but Paul asks is he the God of the Jews only if he is then he's only going to save or will only save the Jews this is a rhetorical question and Paul answers the question so we have an inspired answer he doesn't even leave the answer to us he says he is also the God of the Gentiles. Yes, he is the God of the Gentiles also. So, how could the Jews deny what the text says? He was not the God of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. If he was God, otherwise they would be limiting him. Paul reduced the definition of Jew and Gentile to two words, and that was circumcised versus uncircumcised. The circumcised were saved by faith. The uncircumcised were saved through faith. And so what we have is God being also the God of the Gentiles. And therefore, since he is the God of the Gentiles, how would the Gentiles be saved? Is it by bringing them into 
and under the law of Moses. Well, this is what some people would think. Now, let's just say whatever your position is. If your position is the Gentiles were the northern kingdom, then was he only the God of the Judeans? Was he only the God of the Jews? You'd have to admit that that won't work. Even in limiting the text to the 12 tribes, he would have to be the God of those Gentiles, of those outside of the land of Israel. He'd have to be the God of those northern tribes who had been cut off, swallowed up by the Gentiles, or by the nations, as they say. But you see, if that's the case, then... God is the God of people outside of those constituted as Israel. It's double speak to say that he's going to save Israel and then have people who are not Israel and say that he will not save those who are not Israel. Because he said, you've been cut off. You are not my people. And trying to go out and figure out how much blood they got in them just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, but nevertheless, in John 4, it was clear that they would be saved through the salvation that came out of the Judeans, because he says, salvation is out of the Judeans. We know what we worship. Salvation is out of the Judeans, meaning that it originated from that source. Christ was of the tribe of Judah. And therefore, he would not require the Gentiles to be brought under the requirement of the law, even though it would be, they would be saved by the salvation that was promised in the law. Now, the question came up, and some of the Pharisees who believed came from Judea to Antioch of Syria. And they taught the brethren that if the Gentiles were not circumcised after the law of Moses, they could not be saved. Now, have you heard that doctrine before? Is that a current teaching that's being made today? Even though they dealt with it in the first century. They taught that if the Gentiles were not circumcised after the law of Moses, they could not be saved. Acts 15. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. Unless, and that means if and only if, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Acts 15 and verse 1. Verse 2. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, look, it created a huge debate. Now look. You had all of these Jews here. They didn't just say, yeah, that's right. No. There was a huge dispute over that question by men who were inspired in the church in the first century and those who were opposing the teaching. It says when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. All right, they wanted to get the authority of the apostles and of the elders in Jerusalem, which was the center of their religion. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the joy to all the brethren. And, you know, and that was related to the conversion of the Gentiles. They caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, 
who rose up. Now look at who they were. Excuse me. It was some of the sect of the Pharisees. Sometimes it's good to know where a doctrine originates. The sect of the Pharisees who believe rose up, saying it is necessary to circumcise them. Now what group did Jesus have problems with the whole time he was teaching? What group was more vocal against him the whole time he was on earth teaching? It was the Pharisees. Now, you see what their doctrine was. And they were fighting Christ, and now they're fighting Paul and Barnabas. And you will see where they're fighting against the rest of the church. And so it says, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believe rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so it sparked a heated debate. This debate continues even to our present day. Circumcision meant indebtedness to keep the whole law. Galatians 5 and verse 2, Paul says, Indeed I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Now he had to be talking about, or two, uncircumcised people. If you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And then he said in verse 5, 3, Again I testify to you, or to every man who becomes circumcised, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. The whole law. Not parts of it. Not some parts you say were gone, or would go away, and then keep the rest. No, he said you are a debtor to keep the whole law. Now, if you made a change to the law, it's not the whole law anymore. James said also that if a man keeps the whole law and offends in one point, he is guilty of all. James 2 and verse 10. But if you bind circumcised on the uncircumcised, then you must bind the whole law. And that is what these Pharisees were teaching. The ones Jesus called hypocrites. Now, so what did they do? They went up to the apostles and the elders. And among them was Peter and James, who were pillars of the church. Men who were highly respected. They were the leading apostles. And so they went up to have this discussion. And Peter, after all this wrangling about do they have to be circumcised? Do we have to impose circumcision on the uncircumcised? Do we have to command them to teach the law? Or to, excuse me, obey the law? To follow the law? To continue the practice of the law? Do we have to bind this on the uncircumcised? Now, I'm not talking about what was on the circumcised. We know from Acts 21 they were still keeping the law. I'm talking about on the uncircumcised. The Bible says in verse 7, And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He gave the Gentiles the Holy Spirit just as he gave it to the Jews. And in so doing, the scripture says God acknowledged them. What was he doing? Acknowledging the uncircumcised by giving them the Holy Spirit. He didn't acknowledge them by giving them the law, by giving them Torah. He acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit. Remember in last week's lesson we asked the question? But this... I want to know of you, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, the Gentiles had heard faith, but they hadn't been circumcised. They had received the Holy Spirit, but they hadn't been circumcised. It 
So God acknowledged them without circumcision. Now, if circumcision indebted one to keep the whole law, then God acknowledged and accepted them without requiring them to keep the law. How much more plain can that get? Can it be? The scripture says, and made no distinction between us and them doing what? Purifying their hearts by faith. Doesn't say by the law, does it? It says he purified their hearts by faith. And if we don't understand that the faith by which they were purified was the gospel as opposed to the law of Moses, then we're misunderstanding the scripture. Purified their hearts by faith. Now watch. That was a mic drop moment. Bam! Because the whole room went silent. No one said a word after that. Well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let me back up just a moment. They did say a few more words before we got to the silent point, so let me get that correct. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now, he says, look, we couldn't do it. The Jews couldn't do it. So why do you give it to the Gentiles and think they can? We've had it for 1,500 years. And we haven't figured out how to keep it. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Now, wait a minute. That is a mouthful. That is a huge, huge point that Peter just made. Peter said that they, the Jews, believe that through the grace of God, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, Jews, shall be saved in the same manner as they. Wait a minute. How were they saved? God acknowledged them without circumcision. God acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit. And therefore, they were going to be saved or were being saved with or through the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and without circumcision. And God says, why are you testing? Or at least Peter asked the Pharisees, why are you testing God to put a yoke on them that we couldn't even bear? Why are you trying to give them something we can't keep? And when he made that statement, Bam! That's when the room went silent. No one uttered a word. And apparently it was a long silence. Because the next verse says, and this is when James speaks up. So you got Peter, who was a pillar in the church, and now you have James, who was a pillar in the church. James answered, it says, and after they have become silent. In other words, nobody was saying anything. Not a person spoke. So this tells you, again, that some people are not really understanding this chapter if they're trying to impose the law. Because when Peter spoke those words, everybody got quiet. If he had been saying, keep the law, they all would have been happy and extending right hand to fellowship and everything else. But that's not what happened. It says, James, after they had become silent, James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. So he quotes the prophets. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So it says the Lord who does all these things. Therefore, 
or known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to keep the law and to be circumcised. Is that what he said? No way. That's not what he said. He said, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Acts 15 and 20. Now that's all the time we have today. We're going to pick up right here at this moment of silence once again on next week as we continue our study on uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 31, so we can understand what the Bible is saying about do we establish the law. Before we go, I'd like to mention a book that we have revised uh, that is called Will Planet Earth Be Planet? We encourage you to get a copy of this book by going to our website. It has a full exegesis of 2 Peter 3, and uh, those of you who are concerned about uh, nuclear weapons, etc., uh, and whether or not the earth is going to be destroyed, or will there be any mankind left on the earth, uh, this book will help you to understand that, but it will give you interpretations and exegesis from the uh, scriptures themselves. The second book is Shipwreck Faith, uh, Transatlantic Slave Trade, or AD 70, and this book is uh, written to discuss Deuteronomy 2868. It's been well received with some great reviews, and I encourage you to get a copy of it also. With that, I'm William Bell with All Things Fulfilled. Thank you for being here. We look forward to having you with us again on next week, same time, 6.30 to 7 p.m. right here on the NOW Network. May God bless you.